Hello, my name is Sam Felton, the Director of the Public Health Collaboration, and welcome to our 2021 virtual conference. It's been a difficult year to say the least, but I just wanted to start off by saying thank you to all of our ambassadors, members, patrons, and scientific advisory board members for all of your support through these difficult times. Without you, we would never be able to continue to better inform the public about the power of lifestyle to help create a better world. Now, before I let the next presenter speak, this conference is 100% free for all forever. However, if you find the content here today valuable, uh, then please consider a £2 donation or whatever you can afford via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. And of course, texts are charged at your standard network rate. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation here on YouTube or by using the hashtag PHC vcon 2021 on facebook instagram and twitter thanks for your support and be well hello my name is dr mark williamson and welcome to this talk on how to be happier how small actions can make a big difference for our well-being I'm delighted to be part of this public health collaboration event and today I'm going to be sharing with you a little bit about myself and Action for Happiness so you know who you're hearing from and I am going to be sharing with you some of the, the science uh, that we work with at Action for Happiness about how we can boost mental well-being and live happier more fulfilling lives and also reflect a little bit on how that relates to the work of PHC, the Public Health Collaboration, and what I think so many of you uh, watching this talk are likely to be interested in. So, um, as I said, my name is Mark Williamson, and I run this charity, uh, Action for Happiness. It's a, um, a registered non-profit in the UK, but also a building a global movement of people taking action for a, a happier world. And I'm just going to share my screen with you so some slides to support what I'm saying today. So hopefully you can now see the slides and still hear me. Um, How to be happier is the title of this talk and uh, the charity Action for Happiness is really a people-led movement for a happier and kinder world. We work with people of all ages in communities, schools, workplaces to try and bring to life the science of well-being in really practical ways that people can use and uh, we're going to touch on some of that in what we're talking about today. Most importantly, we have an amazing army of volunteers all around the UK, all around the world, in fact, running local activities in their communities to bring people together, both face to face and online, to share experiences and to take action. Um, just a, a really quick thumbnail of the sort of things we, we, we're up to. We have a, a, a web platform which has had over 10 million um, users uh, in recent years. We have an online community of over a million people following our activities. We have a, a sort of membership based movement of about 260,000 people. We put on live public events both in person and online more recently during COVID, uh, which have been attended live by over 150,000 people. And uh, our volunteers have helped run activities in over 250 local communities. That's a really brief sense of the kind of scale of this very small organization, but with a, a relatively big reach. Uh, my own background, I was originally a scientist engineer, studied um, electronics, did a PhD, uh, then worked in the commercial world for a decade or more as a consultant working in financial services, then had a complete change of path, moved into perhaps the world of social good, spent uh, a long time working as an innovation director at the Carbon Trust. And then for the last decade, I've been having the privilege to help create and lead this movement, Action for Happiness. And this is a picture of me uh, having the great privilege to um, host and collaborate with the Dalai Lama, who's also the patron of our charity. And alongside him, I've also um, worked with many leading experts on the science of well-being and happiness. And I'll be trying to share some of their wisdom with you today in this session. But just before I do that, I wanted to share a little bit about my own journey in regards to 
public health collaboration and the work that so many of you watching this, I'm sure, are interested in. Um, back in 2015, I adopted a, a real food lifestyle. I made some pretty dramatic changes to cut out the sugary um, and processed carbs in my life and to, to, to try and make more healthy and uh, nutritional choices, very much in line with the kind of work that PHC recommends. And it, as perhaps is no surprise to you, had a massive impact on my life. At the time I'd recently taken up cycling, I'm still an incredibly keen cyclist, but I'd noticed that all these sugary bars and gels that we were being asked to consume as many athletes are, weren't doing me much good. And, and at the start of this graph, my weight had actually gone up slightly due to I think all the sugar I was consuming. Now I should say I was never trying to lose weight. That was not been my objective, but I have been keeping an eye on it as I've made these transitions. And what this graph briefly shows is that I uh, almost without intending to lost about well over 10 kilograms within two years, partly by moving to a, a sort of low carb real food way of eating and then bringing in some intermittent fasting and sort of reducing my time window for uh, calorie intake uh, during the day. And since then, I've maintained uh, that lower weight quite happily and without any dieting, without any sort of hassle for four years. So that, I think that's a lovely example of why what you're all doing is, as part of this PhD community really does work and help. And it'll be no surprise again to many of you to know that it also helped me in loads of other ways. So my endurance in terms of athletic performance has changed completely. I have much more energy and can keep going for longer. My immunity seems to be much better. I seem to hardly ever get ill these days. And also, it, especially in the context of what we're talking about today, my well-being overall seems to have been boosted. I feel happier and more resilient. And I think that is at least in part to do with those lifestyle changes to do with nutrition. So let's move on to that topic of well-being and happiness and resilience. And I'd like to start with a quote from a, a dear friend of mine, Mathieu Ricard, who was a former eminent uh, biochemist who then moved to become a Buddhist monk and has spent many years living and practicing meditation and other sort of contemplative practices. And uh, he's very much of interest to neuroscientists who when they put him into an MRI scanner find that his levels of brain activity, both in response to dealing with adversity, but also cultivating a sense of presence and calm He's sort of off the chart. He's been called uh, the happiest man uh, alive, much that he doesn't like that title himself. But Mathieu has this lovely quote, uh, happiness is a deep sense of flourishing, not a mere pleasurable feeling or a fleeting emotion, but an optimal state of being. That's really what I'm talking about today. How do we cultivate that optimal state of well-being, happiness, whatever you'd like to call it, um, to really help people thrive and flourish? even in the midst of the very difficult times that many of us are facing now, and indeed always facing to some extent in the reality of our human condition. So let's pause for a moment here and just think about, well, a question for you as the audience. What is it that really makes people happy in your own life, in your experience, people you love, the people you work with? What is it that really does lead to that sort of deeper, more authentic source of happiness? Now, of course, there are no right or wrong answers to this. Many things may have come to mind for you as you contemplate that. But you may have found that your answers are a bit like many of the thousands of people I've asked this question to before who say things like, well, it's kind of about the people, actually. It's about connection, love, togetherness. It's about having a sort of sense of purpose and knowing what you stand for and believing in something. It's about a sense of sort of autonomy, the, the freedom to, to make choices, to choose what you focus on and to live with that, that sort of sense of purpose. It's about kindness, it's about helping others, it's about sort of being part of something and feeling valued and feeling like you're making a contribution. It's about nature, it's about being connected with the world around us, it's about you know all living beings, not just the humans. There's, there's many different aspects to this. Um, and maybe some of what I just said there rings true for you too. And we'll go on to that in a bit more detail because we have a framework at Active for Happiness called the 10 Keys to Happier Living, which you can hopefully see on screen now. Now, these are not 10 commandments. Everyone's different. What works for one person doesn't necessarily work for another. But the unique thing about these is they're firstly all based on empirical evidence coming from the latest research in psychology, neuroscience and related fields. But they're also things that are at least in part within our control. So it's not um, necessarily dependent on others, we can to some extent choose to cultivate more of these in our lives and indeed to help them with others around us too. So I'll just very briefly go through each of these 10 in turn and then we're going to focus on three of them in a little bit more detail for the rest of this session. 
the giving, when we do things for others, when we're kind, it also gives us a great boost to our well-being too. Relating, our relationships are probably the most important contributor to our overall happiness. Um, you know, when we feel connected, we thrive more. And when we feel isolated, that's really bad for our well-being. Exercising, we all know that looking after our bodies is great for our physical health. That's what lots of you are focused on. It's also brilliant for our mental well-being. We know that being active outdoors, for example, can be as, at least as effective and perhaps much longer lasting in terms of dealing with mental health challenges like depression and anxiety. It really, really does boost our mood. Awareness, this idea of living mindfully, getting out of this habit of always worrying about the past or worrying about the future and just being here right now. Very uh, difficult to do in the world of digital devices when we're constantly distracted by our screens. Trying out, this is about lifelong learning, not just in an educational sense, but continuing to cultivate new skills, to try out new hobbies, whether that's joining in a choir or trying a new walking route or taking up a new form of physical activity. There are so many ways to keep learning throughout our lives. The next five um, direction is about having hopes and dreams and goals that we're working towards. And those goals can be big, lofty ambitions, but they also need to be very specific, concrete and achievable things that we try and do on a daily basis. Resilience we're going to talk more about, but it's that ability to bounce back, especially in difficult times. So important, especially with what many are facing right now. Emotions we'll also talk about, this idea of cultivating, um, looking for what's good, even when we're feeling a mix of emotions, some of which might be very difficult. Acceptance, that ability to try and be comfortable with who you are in a world of social comparison where many of us are actually really, really harsh on ourselves. And finally, meaning, uh, that, that thought about being part of something bigger than yourself, getting outside of yourself and being part of something, whether that's your religious faith, your connection to a cause you care about, your family, your views on nature and the environment, whatever it might be. So that's a quick whistle-stop tour through the 10 keys. Um, I hope at least some things in there are resonating with you and, and indeed the people you work with and love and, and help in the work that you do. I'm going to now focus on three of these in a bit more detail and we're going to sort of think about how we can make this part of our daily lives. And let's start with this idea of emotions. And emotions are signals to, to act. And actually all emotions have value. Uh, I don't think it's helpful to characterize emotions as positive and negative in terms of their impact, because what you might think of as negative emotions have really important signals too. When we're angry, it's a sign that we've been wronged. When we're scared, it's a sign that there's a danger. When we're sad, it's a sign that we've lost something. These, these emotions all have signals to us. But very often um, we don't allow ourselves to perhaps tap into and notice the, the things that cultivate positive emotions and the sources behind them. And there's a reason for this, because as we grew up and evolved in the savannah, um, you know, we've always been tuned in to negative things and had an ancestor heard a rustle in the bushes and thought, ah, oh, that's probably not a saber-toothed tiger. They probably would have not survived. And indeed, you know, genetically, if you like, we're wired to focus on what's wrong. And that's really important, even today when we're not necessarily facing life or death survival decisions on a daily basis. But what we so often forget to do is also cultivate a focus on what's good. So let's try this just right now. Stop whatever you're doing right now. Just take a pause and just bring to mind, you know, reflecting on maybe the last day or so, the last 24 hours, try and bring to mind something that you feel positive about. So a good thing that's happened in the last day or so for you. Something you feel grateful for. It could be a really big thing, like a work achievement, a lovely family milestone, or it could be a tiny thing, like a smile from a stranger like a moment of sunlight coming in um, on an unexpectedly bright morning, um, a friendly joke with a, 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 you know, someone you care about. Whatever it is, bring to mind something that you're grateful for. Now, for some of you, that might come very naturally. For others, and this is certainly the case for me some years ago, it can be quite unusual to be doing this. It's not a habit we necessarily do very much of, but I, I believe it should be, and this is why. So when... Uh, in the randomized controlled trial, people were asked to do this exercise for just a few minutes each night to stop, reflect on things they're grateful for and write them down. Um, they found that uh, one week, one month, three months, six months, in fact, for the whole duration of the study, there was a really significant increase in levels of happiness and decrease in the risk of depressive symptoms. This tiny little action can have a really substantial impact on our mental well-being. And 
Um, you know, it all comes from just literally a few minutes a day to focus on what's gone well. So this is a really powerful action we can build into our own lives. And we can also bring it to those around us. We can ask our kids, not how was your day, but what's been good today. We can start our team meetings or our consultations with our patients, whatever it is you do work-wise, with what's going well, not just what's wrong. This gives people a chance to notice the good as well as the bad, which we will inevitably always focus on as well. And it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes. Enjoy the little things, because one day you may look back and realize they were the big things. And I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. We're so often rushing around that we don't pay attention to the little tiny moments of joy that we can be grateful for on a daily basis. And it, and it really matters. Let's move on to a second key, resilience. This is vital. Uh, it's all very well talking about happiness, but of course we all deal with loss. We all deal with adversity. We all have problems and you know, frustrations. We make mistakes, we're ill, loved ones die. There's, there's all kinds of stuff that's part of life. Um, and that's normal and that's natural. And I think resisting the fact that things, you know, don't always go to plan is, is itself a great source of suffering. And of course, in the recent pandemic, we've seen huge amounts of devastation and loss, and that's been um, really difficult to deal with. So how can we develop resilience in the face of these inevitable, difficult times? Well, a model I find really helpful um, uh, it's sometimes called the ABC model, and it comes from cognitive behavioral therapy, which many of you will be aware of as a vitally important tool to support people. But I like to think of this as a life skill that every child should ideally learn in school and that we can all use on a daily basis, not just in a therapeutic sense. The A is adversity. We all have things that go wrong and that are challenges in our lives. Uh, that's inevitable. The C is the consequences. And we kind of think that we jump straight to these that I feel a certain way, uh, I act a certain way because of the adversity that happens to me. But actually there's a B that's between these, uh, these two. The B is our beliefs uh, or, or, or perhaps the thoughts um, that we're having. So we might say, oh, this project is driving me mad right now. Uh, and as a result, we feel angry. And what we do is we kind of, you know, we take it out on people around us. Um, because of you know, an issue that's happened in the piece of work. But actually, um, you know, the belief here is that you know, the project should be going a certain way and it's my fault or um, I've been let down. And in fact, it's that sort of interpretation of what's happened that's driving more of how we feel and what we do. Now, it may be perfectly reasonable to be angry or upset in a certain situation, but we have a choice. We have an ability to choose how we interpret the adversity before it necessarily drives our feelings and our actions. And this is the real secret to dealing with challenges. And it comes back to this um, you know, very basic idea that we can't really change adversity, but we can choose how we interpret it and therefore how we feel and what we do. And perhaps one of the most stunning and moving and harrowing examples of this comes from an amazing book called Man's Search for Meaning written by Viktor Frankl, who was in Auschwitz in a concentration camp in the most horrific situation. And despite all of what he was dealing with, uh, he managed to not only survive, but really kind of help and inspire others around him. And he has this famous quote, which I love, everything can be taken from a man or indeed a woman, but one thing, the last of human freedoms, choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So here was Victor in the most horrific situation being able to choose to maintain a sense of optimism or to respond constructively, even in this horrific situation. So I think that really is the secret to resilience. If you can't change it, change the way you think about it. We really can't choose or change what happens to us, but we can choose how we respond. And that is the, 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 the very essence of uh, choice and the very essence of you know, being able to adapt to the difficult things that will happen in our lives. And let's finally move on to acceptance, another one of these 10 keys to happier living, this idea of being comfortable with who you are. Very easy to say, but actually incredibly hard to do, especially in the world of social comparison. We are you know, obviously bombarded now with social um, interaction via particularly social media, but just digitally in many different ways. And it can be really unhelpful because we are comparing effectively other people's showreels, their perfectly manicured, and curated lives with the reality of how we're feeling on the inside, which of course may seem completely disconnected. Uh, and that's not really a, a helpful comparison to be making. 
But one of the, the really powerful things I've seen happening, particularly over the last five years, and also during uh, the COVID pandemic, is a really strong recognition now that it's okay to not be okay. And in fact, that other people are feeling that way too. Um, instead of this sort of, we're all fine, we're all perfect, life is great. There's a sense of vulnerability and a removal of some of that shame that comes or has traditionally been associated with admitting that things aren't going to plan. And in fact, a real power comes when we're able to sort of take off the mask to, to let someone we know in the appropriate situation, perhaps the right people, but really you know, lower our guard and say, this is how I'm feeling, I'm struggling right now. And actually that's, that's okay, that's natural, that happens to all of us. That's the, the first step to, to sort of dealing with that. But it's also worth noting that we all have an inner critic. We all have a voice that can be really hard on ourselves. I was shocked when I first realized just how viciously I sometimes speak to myself. I might be really compassionate and caring and loving to someone else I care about when they've made a mistake. But when it's me that's made the mistake, I'm an effing this and an effing that. And I, it's, wow, where does that hostility to myself come from? And, and we're not sort of going to magically change that overnight, but really the most important response to this is just to try to speak to ourselves the way that we would speak to somebody else that we really love and care about. This is not about some kind of pampering or narcissism. It's just saying, be as kind to yourself as you would to anybody else that you care about and value and love. Treat everyone kindly, including yourself, as this graphic is showing us on screen. So that's a, a really quick dive into three of the 10 keys to happier living. Uh, there's plenty more information on this framework and lots of things behind each of these keys that you can potentially use and share. I'd just like to draw your attention to a couple of things. First of all, we have a free 10 day online coaching program that introduces each of the 10 keys day after day for 10 days uh, with a little action idea. And you have a little digital online coach called Leah who helps you through that journey. So it's a great starting point for anyone who'd like to find out more about this or anyone you'd like, you think could help uh, or be helped by finding out more about the 10 keys. And that's 10 days of happiness.org. We also have uh, monthly themes that run all year round following different aspects that fit within this framework. So this is an example of active April, which is the month we're just finishing as I film this. We're about to begin meaningful May to be followed by joyful June and so the painful alliteration continues throughout the world the year through self-care September and do good December and, and lots more. Um, so there's a daily action each day. Every, every day has something, little concrete thing we can do. And it's, it really is a combination of these tiny actions that build up to really lasting and meaningful change in our lives. And you can get involved in a lovely community of people who are seeing these actions every day, responding to them and sharing them on the Action for Happiness app, which is available on the app stores search action for happiness or go to the the link shown on screen here you get the daily action each day you get access to the calendars but you also get other inspiring ideas and, and particularly a chance to connect with other people who are putting these into practice every day it's a really lovely antidote to the toxicity of social media generally with a really friendly supportive uh, community so that's the 10 keys and before i end i also just wanted to pause and reflect on why what I think you, the audience here, uh, are generally doing is so important as part of this public health collaboration and the wider move towards, I think, you know, really trying to reframe the whole way we think about health, public health, nutrition and lifestyle in the UK and also more widely. Because I think these thank yous link not only to our well-being in, in a really strong sense, but also to this mission to transform the approach to nutrition and lifestyle that um, PhD and, and others here are so passionate about giving. When you um, share these, your work, your ideas on nutrition with others, you're helping, you're really making a difference. Relationships, there's so much around supporting each other in making some of these lifestyle changes that you're working on that really helps to boost connection. Um, exercising and look after your physical health. Uh, you know, what, what, what we're doing here uh, around nutrition and lifestyle and bringing movement into our our lives it is not just great for the physical health, for our weight, for our um, digestive system. It's fantastic for our mood as well. And let's not forget that. Awareness and uh, living life mindfully has a huge implications when it comes to what we eat and how we live, that kind of conscious choice and sort of rather than mindlessly snacking on the sofa, being able to be choosing what we eat. Trying out, I mean, uh, I embraced uh, this um, real food lifestyle as a brand new thing and actually was really found some energy that came from 
making some changes and trying out new ways of cooking and new ways of exercising. And it's been really powerful for me. Direction, um, you know, having goals and setting new directions. I mean, whether it's a, a weight loss goal or a health improvement goal, the work that you're doing with PhD is a great example of having tangible things that matter to you that you're working towards. Resilience, uh, we all face um, difficult times. And I think actually having healthier lifestyle and nutritional choices is also a form of supporting our coping. Emotions, noticing what's good, being grateful for those moments where we are able to make wiser, healthier choices and to see the good in others and support them in their journeys as well. Acceptance, there's a lot of shame that comes with the world of health and weight and nutrition. And I think recognizing that um, we need to get beyond that shaming and to help people feel comfortable with who they are, however they are, and whatever little change they can make it matters. It's not about comparing ourselves to others. And then finally, meaning, this idea of being part of something bigger. I think you're all, we're all part of this community um, working towards something that's really important. So thank you for sparing your time for this talk. Thank you for all that you're doing. Thank you to the PHC for this opportunity and wishing you a healthy, happy and fulfilling uh, rest of 2021 ahead as we hopefully continue to emerge from what's been a really difficult time for our world. Thank you so much. Uh, and on that, I will stop sharing um, and say, uh, yeah, thanks again. Mark Williamson, please do feel free to get in contact with me to follow Action for Happiness and to share any of what you've seen in this talk today with others if you'd like to. Really appreciate your time. All the best. Thanks.